Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our scripture readings are taken from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 9. This is the reading for the blessing of the palms, which takes place on Palm Sunday. So if you remember um, going to a Palm Sunday, if you've been before, you know that we have the Gospel of Matthew, I believe it is, that's, that's read um, during the Mass, uh, during the Liturgy of the Word and the, and the Proclamation of the Gospel. Prior to that, however, and sometimes this is done outside the church, you'll have the reading of uh, Matthew 21, 1 through 9, and the blessing of the palms, and then the congregation will process into the church. Uh, so this is really beautifully, I think the, the one of the most beautiful times I've seen this was when I worked in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, we would actually start the Mass, um, the Mass was started with the blessing of the palms in the plaza, um, at, a, at a gazebo in, in the plaza, we would do the, the reading there and then we would process in to the mass. Really beautiful kind of starting off this Holy Week uh, with, with ushering in Christ the King um, and saying the same words, singing or chanting the same words that is used in the gospel today. Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Hosanna to the son of David, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, of course, in the Catholic Mass, at every single Catholic Mass, we uh, sing or chant or say a prayer called the Sanctus. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. And at the end of that prayer, we say, we pray, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It'll be shortly after that, and sometimes depending on the Mass and the choir and all of that, but it'll be timed that shortly after we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, guess what takes place? Jesus Christ is now present on the altar. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ has come to us. He is the Lord, the King of Kings. And so this is very familiar, not just one time a year at Palm Sunday, but actually at every single mass, we praise Jesus the way that he was praised when he entered into um, the city of Jerusalem. So we get to pretty much live that out at every Mass, that, that we get to be that person on the street ushering Christ, not necessarily into a city, but into our lives, into our heart, into our cities, into our homes, um, into our countries. We want to always usher Christ in and never betray him, never later to say crucify, crucify, but to always say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we get to do that at every single mass, every single day. And because of the time zones, there's a mass happening everywhere. So technically it's being done all the time, ushering Christ into this world. Um, so what do they mean here by son of David? Hosanna to the son of David. What did the Jewish people, what were they waiting for? What were they thinking Jesus would be? Um, so Jesus means God saves. That's what his name means. God saves. It tells you who he is and what he does. He's God and he saves. He is both man and God. The two natures, one person, two natures. Uh, this is the teaching of the church, the constant teaching. It was attacked by Arius, um, the Arian heresy, uh, which prevailed for, for lots of years, I think two, 200, 300 years, uh, still has roots in things, um, but the truth has conquered. And the truth is that Jesus Christ is one person, one divine person, um, with two natures, uh, human nature and a divine nature. So, all right, with that being said, um, let's look at uh, him as a man. Um, what are they expecting him to be? They're expecting him to be the Messiah or the Christ. Christ is the Greek word, Messiah is the Hebrew word, but it's the same thing. It'll, he will be prophet, priest, and king. That's what the Jews were expecting. They were awaiting Christ, the Messiah. Why? Because it was prophesied in Genesis 3.15 that the Messiah would come and conquer Satan. So, so this is what the Jews were expecting. This and nothing, nothing more than this. So to make the claim that he is the son of the living God is definitely something that was not expected. Um, you know, Peter does make, Peter does profess this faith. He says, uh, you, you are the Christ, meaning you are the Messiah, you are the Christ. And then he also says, you are the son of the living God. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, what about the son of the living God? What does that mean? Well, the emperor claimed to be the son of God, meaning that if you're the son of God, you share in God's nature. So the Romans at the time, 
did worship gods, um, but they also worshiped the emperor. Um, and they believed that the emperor, as the son of God, was also divine, had a share in divinity and was God. Um, so it's interesting because the Gentile, during the time of Jesus, you had one group that's awaiting this perfect man, prophet, priest, and king, the Messiah, the Christ. And then you have another group of people, the Gentiles, particularly in the Roman Empire, which was vast at that time, um, worshiping a man, the emperor, that they believed was both man, but also divine. Um, Jesus will be both of these. Jesus will be the long-awaited Messiah, the Christ, and he is also true God and true man. He doesn't just share in the nature of God, but he is God. He is true God and true man. So I want to go back to what the Jews were thinking, the prophet, priest, and king. And if they're making a checklist, which I have here in the notes, they would have to ask, well, is he a prophet? Is he a priest? And is he a king? In other words, does he does he match up with this, this checklist that I have? I've been waiting for the Messiah for 4,000 years. Does he check all the boxes? Um, I think prophet is the easiest one. Yes, he says things, he, he predicts the destruction of the temple, he predicts all kinds of things, and he's right. He teaches with authority. They even say, they they, they compare him to Elijah. Uh, they, they compare him to John the Baptist. So they compare him to great prophets. So it's not a stretch at all to say Jesus Christ is definitely a prophet. In fact, the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman says he's a prophet. The blind man says he's a prophet. Uh, they, people say all the time, sir, I can see that you're a prophet. So this is pretty easy. Um, what about a priest? Well, he's not a Levite. He's in the line of Judah, so he's not a Levite. So he's not a Levitical priest, but there was never the claim that he was. In fact, um, I think it's Psalm 110 um, talks about that he will be in the line of Melchizedek. He will be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a mysterious priest that arrived uh, during the time of Abraham that offered bread and wine. Um, and, and so if you're not looking for a Levitical priest, you're looking for the Melchizedek priesthood, then Jesus also checks this box. Um, King is pretty easy because he actually is um, a son of David. He is in the descendants of David, which is the line of Judah. And the prophecy does say that it'll be, um, the, the scepter will, will be taken away, but then will return to the line of Judah, which matches perfectly the timing of Jesus and King Herod. King Herod was the first person uh, that was outside of the line of, of David. And that was the prophecy actually that would, would take place. Um, so Jesus is a king. He's in the kingly line. He's in the house of Judah. Um, but however, he doesn't look like a king. He is a simple man. He is a carpenter. You know, he lives in Nazareth. So he doesn't look very kingly or stately. So this can be a little tricky too. Um, when you look at Matthew twenty-two forty-four, so this is Matthew 21. If you look just one chapter ahead to Matthew 22, Jesus himself is going to mention David, uh, who obviously is one of his ancestors, and he's going to say, what do you say about the Christ? Who is he? And, and he quotes uh, the Psalms where he says that, that David himself, King David said, the Lord said to my Lord. So the Lord said to, David should say here, my son, my descendant, but he says here, my Lord. So this means that the son of David will also be Lord, meaning that he's not just going to be an earthly king, but that he will be God. He will be Lord. The Lord said to my Lord. Um, so now we have kind of all the pieces here. Um, what does this have to do with um, really Christ and his church? Well, if we look at, particularly let's look at the Jewish faith right now. Um, the Jewish faith doesn't have a sacrifice and they don't have a priesthood. What church does have a sacrifice and what church does have a priesthood? It's the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has the holy sacrifice of the mass and the Catholic Church has holy orders, the priesthood. Um, what church is speaking the truth in a world of falsehood? You know, of course, the Catholic Church can do better at that. Everyone can do better at that. Um, but you see that it is the Catholic Church that is speaking these truths consistently throughout 2,000 years. 
and through the God, grace of God will continue to do that. And we need to do that boldly, so boldly that we're even willing to be martyred for that. Are other faiths doing that? Is the Jewish faith doing that? Is it united in that voice? Um, and then King, is Jesus just an earthly king? No, he's not. Is he just the king of heaven? No, he is not. Is he just the king of our heart, that he dwells on the throne of my heart? No, much more than that. Not just reigning in heaven, not just reigning in my heart, and not just reigning in the tabernacle in the church or through the leadership of the church. He also needs to reign in society. We can't lock Jesus up just in our heart or just in our churches or just in our tabernacles or limit him just to a heavenly king that doesn't care about us um, or even you know, just, just in our heart, whatever it is, he has to be everywhere. He has to be in society. And this is why we extend the kingship. Well, we don't extend it. It is extended. He was enthroned on the cross. This cross is the center of the universe. It is the center of society. And so Christ is king over all of society, over every king, every, over every president, every dictator. He is the king of kings. And we need to work towards this, never locking him up. And so, yes, Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. He continues this through his bride, the church. That's very important. He continues being this prophet, the mission of a prophet, priest, and king through his church. And you can only find one church that is actually saying this and doing this. That's the Catholic Church. Um, but he is also God. And, and he is to be worshipped and adored. And so, true God and true man. Now, there's one also interesting thing, and I'll kind of wrap up with this. One other interesting thing is that he it says that he is riding on both an ass and a colt. Um, and, of course, he can't be riding on two animals at once. Um, and so I, I think it's uh, Father Cornelius Lepide, I think is how you say his his name. Um, he's, a, he's a commentator. Um, and he would say that, and this is his reflection here, that the ass represents the Jewish people. Um, and, and the cult represents the Gentiles. So the cult has never been broken in, has never been ridden before. Um, the Gentiles have never experienced the yoke of the law. The, the ass has already been burdened with that yoke, with the law. They have already been disciplined. They have already been worked. You know, you think of a donkey, you think of an ass as a hard worker, that lots of load has been put on them. And so this represents the Jewish people that have been obedient to the law, have been burdened by the law, but also have been obedient to the law of Moses and have been, um, in a sense, uh, ridden by God. Um, and, and Jesus will start by riding the ass. He will show that he is above that and riding that and conquering that he is coming for the Jews, that he is um, the one that is their Lord. But then he will shift and also ride on the colt, and he will ride actually into the city on the colt, showing that he also is above and is has dominion over the Gentiles, all lands. So the Jews would be represented, of course, by the city of Jerusalem. The Gentiles would be represented by the city of Rome. Jesus will not only conquer both these people, the Jews and the Romans, um, and he wants to not just, he doesn't want to conquer, he wants to conquer as to convert. So Jesus doesn't come to uh, steal and kill and destroy like the thief. He comes to take what's good about the Jews and to build, up, build upon and perfect, to elevate. He comes to take what's good about the Gentiles and build upon and perfect, to elevate. So grace builds upon nature and Christ will build upon uh, what he has already done in these cultures. Now, Jerusalem will be actually destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. And then we know that Rome will eventually uh, succumb and become Christian. Um, and that will happen in 300 AD. So interesting enough, the ass represents the Jewish people, Jerusalem. The cult represents the Gentile people, Rome. Both will be eventually conquered by Christ and his church. Um, although Christ has conquered these groups and these cities and his church has conquered, has he conquered our heart? And obviously we need some re-evangelization because places that have been conquered by Christ, uh, places that have put on the sweet, sweet yoke of Christ, um, have now thrown that yoke off. 
have now said, I refuse to be conquered by Christ. Um, and remember, the conquering of Christ is a true liberation and a true joy. Um, because when we are conquered by Christ, we are able to live in peace and not have sin conquer us. Um, we can truly say, I, I love you, Lord, and I want to be conquered by you. I want to be um, not just your slave, but your friend. And I want, I want you to come in and conquer my sinful desires and my sinful ways, not just in, in my life, but then in our society as well. I want you to reign. Um, so yes, Jesus did conquer um, these cultures, but we need to be conquered again. We need to be conquered by love, the love of Christ. Uh, we need to allow Christ to conquer our sinfulness, um, especially that original sin. Take on that beautiful yoke of his, take on that grace, take on that love that he gives us um, so that we can truly allow him to reign in all areas. And so now he will, with this, with, 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 as he conquers us and we allow him to liberate us from sin, he then will reign in our hearts, our homes, our kingdoms, um, and everywhere. And that's, that's as, it, as it should be because he is the true prophet, priest, and king. He is God. Um, by our baptism, we are united to him. We put on Christ. We become prophet, priest, and king, sharing in his life, sharing in his priesthood, his prophet, his kingship, and also partaking in the divine life, which is absolutely amazing that, that us as humans who really have no right to the divine life can receive that divine life from him. So again, baptism is so important. If you've been baptized, cherish that because it's at that baptism that you share in Christ, prophet, priest, and king, and partake in his nature. If you're not baptized, find out, go to your local Catholic church, find out how to be baptized. Um, if for whatever reason you have lost the grace, the sanctifying grace that you gained at baptism through a serious sin, repent, go to confession, gain back that grace so that we can truly live as partakers of the divine life, sharing in the prophet, priesthood, and kingship of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me for this Lexio on the go. Please take the time to visit linktoliturgy.com where you'll find fast, free, and faithful resources on the gospel. And check out our online school, linktoliturgy.teachable.com. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.